Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our event. This is Emerging Cyber Threats in the Post-Corona Era. Uh, I'm delighted that we have an informative guest joining us today, Annie Searle. Uh, Annie, welcome to our event here. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you for being here. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, in these events, we try to avoid having product pitches in our webinars. Instead, try to focus on information that business leaders can use to run their businesses more securely, more operationally efficient. And for that reason, we look to executives, business leaders, folks from academia to speak to our audience. And Annie checks a lot of those boxes in that she is currently the head at ASA Risk Consultants, and that's a role that she's had for many years. She is an associate teaching professor emeritus from the University of Washington Information School. And there she taught courses on cybersecurity, on risk, on ethics. Prior to that, she was an executive at Washington Mutual, and she was there for 10 years. And in that role, she managed business technology continuity, disaster recovery, technology risk, and compliance. And you're smiling, I'm, I'm not done yet, but I'm close. And then prior to that, she had a, a, a career as an entrepreneur. And for 15 years, she ran Delphi Computers and Peripherals and was the president and CEO of that organization as well. Did I miss anything, Annie? No, no, oh. it just sounds sounds like an obituary. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine. It, it just starts to sound like a, an obituary if you go any further. Okay, well, I'm glad you stopped. It, it, it's nowhere near that, and I'm sure we have some <laughs> some riveting topics to discuss today. Before I jump in with questions, I want to mention to folks that are in attendance that this is a little bit different than events that we've hosted in the past, in that there is not there's no PowerPoint today. There's not a contiguous prepared presentation. Instead, I have a lot of questions that I'm going to pose to our guest. Um, those of you in attendance, you're welcome to present questions as well. You can. We won't put you on screen or, or uh, unmute your mic, but you can pose them via the chat session or using the Q&A feature in Zoom. And I'll do my best to moderate those as, I, um, as we go through the event here today, or as we go through the hour. But first, I'm going to jump in, Annie, with kind of a rudimentary question. I'll give you a, an easy pop quiz for a starter. Um, in technology, there is oftentimes a lot of um, misuse of terminology or some words are used to mean the same things. And I thought it wouldn't hurt to start with just some basic definitions of some words that we often use on the technology side that sometimes get misused as well. So from your perspective, could you speak to the definitions and the differences between a threat, a vulnerability, and a risk? Um, a risk is the overall umbrella for the other two. Um, a threat is usually uh, identified through analysis and before something happens. To your environment. Um, it And it differs from a vulnerability in that it's identifying something that is generally external to your environment. A vulnerability is something that is found through testing, observation, or uh, knock on wood by a regulator or an auditor. Uh, and that's a weakness. It's a problem in your infrastructure, whether it's in the cybersecurity area, it's mainframe, Unix, wherever it is, the vulnerability means that were someone to be able to get into your environment, they would be able to take advantage of that and move more freely in your environment uh, than otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I know, you, you know, in from the perspective of a company like EXP Technical, oftentimes, and I think other network administrators and IT managers as well, use the word consequence and risk interchangeably. Because when you're managing multiple environments, multiple end users, the risk is inevitable. You know, it it may only happen, a hard drive failure might be a once in a lifetime or none time in a lifetime event for an individual, but it happens all the time for IT support providers. That's right. And, you know, we have a lot more collected data to tell us how important that kind of a risk, a failure of a hard drive is, um, right. than we had, say, even 10 years ago. 
and then it all falls under the umbrella of disaster. And <laughs> well, and the, the I disaster, hate that in in my world, um, which is granted a, a fairly specific one. Um, a disaster involves uh, chaos, not only inside your business, but generally externally as well, to people, um, to uh, conditions, uh, sometimes having to do with weather, sometimes having to do with a terrorist event, right. a man-made event, rather than a, a natural disaster. Um, and so that 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 word is a, is within a technical vocabulary in the world of emergency management mm -hmm. disaster something and, and it's very like you see something called a hurricane cat 5 cat 3 cat 2 then when it becomes less consequential there's your word um it drops to be a tropical storm mm -hmm. um so uh, I don't know what I'd say other than that. Um, <laughs> I, but well, I think I, risk and consequences aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, if you own your own business and you were sitting at the top, the one thing you'd want to make sure your people had done was a broad cross section of your leadership had sat around a table and identified, for example, the top 10 risks that you see to the company. Right. and argued about them and how they should be stacked up, which is more important than another and why is that? And once something like that has been done, then the next logical step is to create what's called a risk register where you list them out. And then you start looking at, is this a high probability or a low probability? Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of the, the stage, is this, highly consequential or is it less consequential and right. that's what you're dealing with um again you're inside the vocabulary and the framework of emergency management when you're doing that kind of work or risk management in general right now if we were to tie those back to experience you personally <laughs> had a backstage pass to i'd say the three most significant events that shaped the direction, the course of history in the, the first part of this century. And I'm referring to the September 11th terrorist attack, the 2008 banking crisis, and then more recently, the pandemic. And I'm curious, what did you learn from those events? How did they change your evaluation of risk? What what did you miss? What did you, what did you learn? What, what lessons can you share with our audience that came from, from your unique perspective and insight into those events? Well, I... Yeah, I started, I'll take your last one first, the pandemic. When I started at Washington Mutual, um, one of the things I was assigned to was a task force that was national and sometimes international, looking at the possible uh, catastrophic impacts of what was swine flu at that time. Um, and I did, I did a lot of the writing for um, the financial sector, published usually in British journals on uh, how ready the financial sector in the United States was to handle a pandemic. So we knew, we knew a lot of things that were true just a few years ago here in this country. Things like up to your, up to 40% of your workforce can be gone just unexpectedly, either because they're sick, they're taking care of someone um, or there's some other circumstance. Right, right. Back in those days, this is 2006, 2007, um, we really weren't set up for remote work. That's a difference between the two. Um, mm -hmm. Nor did we, in all of the uh, all of the work we did inside work groups at Washington Mutual. Um, so different business units would the senior vice presidents got together and sat down. And they had to answer three questions. Which of our business processes do we have to maintain? Which of them can we do less frequently than we do right now? And then which ones can we suspend for some inde indeterminate period of time? Um, 
And that gave us a kind of master plan or the, the foundation for a master plan that we created. So we actually had a business continuity plan for pandemic that sat right next to our regular plans called all hazard plans that would handle a fire, uh, wildfires or hurricanes or other kinds of events like that. Um, and I, you know, what I learned uh, was, I think, very useful to my boss at the University of Washington, the dean of the iSchool and in day. Um, I was, I, because of work groups that I still sit on, um, I received alerts and bulletins and perhaps material not widely available to the public, and I was able to pass those along. And I was able to answer questions at times as well that perhaps he would have found it hard to get answers to otherwise. Mm -hmm. On 911, that's an entirely different matter. And I think the most important reason we should remember 911 is that it's so possible that it could happen again, despite everything we've done. Um, I learned from that, and that and that was a hard lesson for me to learn. I had about 200 people in my group at the time. Um, the leadership at the bank went into this room across the street that had a TV set in it. I think that was probably all, and they never came out during the day. And so that meant they left all their managers hanging, whether it was a manager of a branch bank who actually had an advantage over us in the corporate side. Branches, branch managers are given authority implicitly to close a branch or open a branch oh. based on a variety of circumstances. Right. But I had trouble knowing whether I could send my people home or not. So I finally went over and knocked on the door and asked my boss. Um, and what that got me was it got me assigned to the crisis management team for the bank for a couple of years until ultimately I was asked to chair the crisis management team and to and I was allowed to remake it as I had recommended into a much smaller, tightly meshed group that were all senior vice presidents and they all had the ability, We, as a group, we had the ability to take actions on behalf of the bank that would cost the bank money without getting further authorization. Mm -hmm. And do you... Um... Was there one more? 911 pandemic. Oh, and the, the banking crisis. crisis. What did I learn? Um, I learned just how uh, troubling it is to be bound by the Securities and Exchange Commission and um, being publicly traded. That meant that the CEO and the executive vice president in the C-suite could not tell their people what was going on unless it had been announced to shareholders mm -hmm. and investors. Um, I actually had the CEO of the bank sort of trapped in an elevator one day and said, you know, Carrie, if you could just talk to people about how you, how you see us coming through it. And he looked at me and he said, I can't say anything. I, I haven't said either to the SEC or uh, to investors. That's, you know, that was the thing. So that's a hard lesson to learn. I think like many senior vice presidents, I hold myself accountable for not having seen earlier and beat the drum in some way. I didn't beat the drum. Mm -hmm. You know, I was told pretty consistently that it was a little rocky, but things were under control or that conditions were improving. Uh, <laughs> as opposed to what I was reading in the newspapers, seeing on CNN at night. Um, so if there are people on the line who occupy senior positions in corporations, um, the one thing I would urge them is always to be super attentive uh, to the jungle drums, including the media, who often uh, know things uh, before uh, the senior management does. Right, right. And, you know, that that's 
good that you tie that back because that's where I was headed to is that your, your experience is at a corporate, uh, highly regulated industry, a large organization. A lot of the folks in attendance are small business owners. They are operations managers, um, uh, business leaders in smaller businesses. And I wonder too, if just to wrap up this segment, if you can tie some of these lessons towards how they might apply sure. in a smaller business, like it would have when, when you ran your own firm. Yeah, I, you know, the one thing that I could perceive, and this would have been the case, and I ran my own company, a computer mm -hmm. hardware company for 15 years before I went to the bank. Right. Um, the, the, I, I think the, the one thing is that um, you, you, you par if you're in a smaller medium business, you're probably not publicly traded at this point. So some of what I've been talking about doesn't apply. But what does apply is the need really, if you want to have a smooth operating team and you've established certain values that you cherish as the CEO, um, you need to exemplify those values. And particularly in times of financial uncertainty, I think for small and medium businesses, this is the rockiest part of it all um, to figure out at what point is it appropriate to invest more based on growth you've seen, say, in the last six to 12 months? Um, and at what point is it appropriate to just hold steady? At what point do you hire more salespeople? Right, right. I mean, right. these are all key questions. Mm hmm and yeah, and to what extent do you invest in mitigating risk, which is a, a challenging question to answer. It's really, it's really hard because um, I think particularly we see, uh, we don't read so much about all the attacks, but I think many of the attacks are on small and medium-sized businesses the, that don't the get, make it make it into the paper. Yes, um, and we. Part of the reason that can happen is that there's a form of either willful ignorance or complacency. It's one of the two that a business owner says that will never happen here. Oh, right. We're not right. a hospital, so we're, no one's ever going to try. Security by obscurity. Us. We're too small. Yeah, we're too small. Nobody, no one would be interested in us. And yet um, there's a new report on cybercrime. You know that that's just come out. You know it's exactly where these people are, sort of investing in uh, launching attacks. You know, I, I'm going to go off script a little bit, but this is this is really important to me. In that, I posted something on LinkedIn about this recently, and it, I shared it from a friend of mine who mentioned that companies like EXP that support small and medium sized businesses, in a way, they're doing a disservice to their clients when they only talk about the MGM, Caesar's Palace That's right. uh, breaches, because it leads to that complacency that you're talking about. People think, yeah. oh, it's just, they're only after the casinos, they're only after yeah. the banks. And the majority of the attacks are at the small and medium sized business That's level. Right. And they're after individuals. They don't care what your data is worth. They care what it's worth to you. They want to hold it for ransom. They want to do all sorts of awful things that disrupt your business so that you'll pay them to get out of that circumstance. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I will Easy money, a, easy e money. Exactly, a and uh, less hardened security, That's fewer exactly right. layers of control over sensitive yeah. data. And I'll put in the plug for those of you that are in attendance, if you're not familiar, EXP Technical hosts EX EXP Academy, which is a security awareness training site. It's at academy.exptechnical.com. And that's a place where you can train your, your staff on how to recognize phishing and other threats. I'm gonna transition to perhaps the next big event and also a chilling sentence from your uh, most recent blog post. I think it was your most recent one. You ended a blog post about September 11th and you said warnings of high risk often go unheeded. And that may be a segue. We are now entering, you know, I, I dubbed this event that we're this, uh, you know, presentation as post corona, but I feel like we're on the threshold of the artificial intelligence era. You know, uh, about a year and a half ago, we had 
mid journey and dolly and even less than a year ago chat gpt became available and if you go to the open ai site and you you um read their blog about safety they talk about the alignment problem the big jurassic park question that they say that artificial intelligence isn't always aligned with human intentions. So maybe I'm, I'm overplaying this, but you can see where I'm headed is that there, there's a, well, maybe, a, what, what are your thoughts about where we're headed with uh, respect to the dawn of artificial intelligence? Well, I think, you know, I think first of all, um, you know, there's some really remarkable things that have been done using AI tools. I think what you're talking about specifically is generative AI. Mm -hmm. And where the the problems may end up being uh, privacy and security problems in terms of what the large learning model sucks in um, or what the company using the tool uh, forgot to set a guardrail against. So that's, I think, an important piece. Um, <laughs> The model, a large learning model only gets better if people are willing to let their data be sucked into it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and yet there's a remarkable piece. I, I'm sorry I didn't send this to you uh, before the uh, broadcast. I'll, I'll send it to you afterwards. Gail Codry from F5, uh, wrote a piece on CISOs and AI for Tech Radar, and she's talking about three different kinds of challenges. But let me just read the third challenge to you. Oh sure. The third major challenge is that AI-powered cyber attack software could try many possible approaches, learn from how we respond to each of them, and quickly adjust its tactics to devise an optimal strategy at a speed much faster than any human attacker. Mm -hmm. We have seen new sophisticated phishing attacks that are utilizing AI, including impersonating individuals, both in writing and in speech. For example, an AI tool called PassGAN, short for Password Generation Adversarial Network, has been found to crack passwords faster and more efficiently than traditional methods. So I think I'm a lot more worried about that than I am about the loss of control of the tool, which mm -hmm. is, you know, because at least as we understand things right now, and I have no reason to disbelieve this would ever be the case, there's always human oversight of the model. And there's tweaking of the model to try to establish a, a lack of bias, right. right? They may make the sample size larger. They may choose different audiences to include in the sample size. We've seen all of the examples, you know, that are that are truly terrible, ranging from using AI um, to generate, to decide what a prison sentence should be, or to, to decide when a prisoner should be let out for time served. We've seen how, based on the, the model that was used, to capture the data, that really impacts people of color significantly differently than white people. Mm -hmm. we, um, we've seen tools like Clearview that police departments have opted into, um, where it's not only a database or a language model that includes uh, photos of you taken uh, if you're arrested for some reason or another, but involves mm -hmm. actual scraping from social media sites as well. And there the problems are significant. Um, DHS uh, put out a RFI a couple of years ago for a vetting enterprise project, they called it, to monitor immigrants. How do you like that? Mm -hmm. And that uses AI tools as well. Mm -hmm. And then we have... Um, Examples in the past, like Google's Project Nightingale, which has been stopped now, but amassing large amounts of medical data, including PHI and complete health histories. So um, you could say that with all of these, 
uh, or the airlines use uh, facial recognition to put, let you get on a plane now. Mm -hmm. American, Delta, number of airlines use that. Um, and all of those, you could say that in the lack of any kind of guidance, which usually means regulation, um, businesses of these large businesses have had to choose how they're going to do things. And if they're an international company or if they sell abroad, uh, they would be constrained somewhat by GDPR. Right. Not by any American regulation at this point. Mm -hmm. Which that circles back to your first point about data protection and the confidence that we have in the folks that we're entrusting our data with. You know, I'm working on a blog post on this right now, but if you go to chat GPT, you have the free version and it's free. And there's, I think the professional version, it's only when you get to the paid enterprise version where they offer, where they explicitly state that the model isn't training itself on the content that you feed it. And even at that, it's their assurance, maybe not I'm not sure, I don't know if there's any regulatory oversight as to whether that's a true statement or not. So I, I think where I'm headed with this, and it sounds like you agree or you can reiterate, is that information conversations that you have with ChatGPT are not necessarily private. Um, and in fact, if you're talking about commercial intellectual property, trade secrets, they may work their way eventually into the language model because it's effectively like a predictive text model that that's looks exactly at how, right. how words work together. Yeah. No, and I that, agree. So beyond the Jurassic Park question or the matrix <laughs> or, or even the weaponization of AI in the current state, there is this danger of people need to be cognizant of how they're using it and w ways in which they may be exposed that they didn't realize. Would, would you agree with that? Yes, I agree. And I I, I have only a, a short GeekWire piece to go by that came out yesterday or today. But Amazon's new model of Alexa where uh, Alexa has allegedly superpowers. That's what they're, <laughs> they're calling it. I'm going to be looking at that really closely, even though I don't have any such device in my house. I wouldn't. Nor do I. <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm going to be looking closely at whether additional features really to boost that whole section of Amazon. I mean, they, Alexa had to cut, that division was cut significantly earlier within the last year. Now they're hiring back up again. Um, and it's not clear to me uh, if all the safeguards are in place or not. That's something I want to look at really closely. You know, that, that leads to another question. This was a little further down in my list, but it's a good segue. So if I understand your bio, or if I read it correctly, you were the executive sponsor of Tech Innovation at Washington Mutual? I was the, for the tech of innovation in within the the technology group it's a technology support group oh, so okay. any empl any employee could uh, propose an innovation i mean there's some rules around it but they could propose an innovation and an innovation was defined not just as something that was totally new but we took a broader approach and said an innovation could be a significant improvement on an existing process or tool that we were using. Mm -hmm. So th this may be appropriate for, again, at a smaller scale for a lot of the business leaders that are in attendance. How can businesses encourage a culture of innovation while still managing cybersecurity risk and other risks? Because they, at times, are competing forces. I think you want it, you want your people comfortable with thinking outside the box. I really do that they're not just supporting the management of a function, um, but that you're constantly encouraging them to look for ways that the process could be improved, the business process itself. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we actually, um, I think it was something like a $500 award and we did this monthly. A five hundred dollar award for reward in for innovation, for, or yes, for the mo for the for the <clears throat> suggestion, and and we did not ever award the cash 
to anyone if we were not able to implement their recommendation. That was the thing. It had to be practical. It had to not be a pie in the sky in the next five years or something like that. It had mm -hmm. to be implementable. And you found that as an effective way to keep people all, always on the lookout for something new, toes, a better way really, of doing yeah. things. And to feel included. Right, right. Which is a big part of it because that goes to the culture from the employee's perspective and morale and feeling like they're part of the, of something meaningful, which is another aspect of cybersecurity because, you know, we're talking about security around groups that innovate, but there's also a culture of cybersecurity that you need to instill in individuals. And that too is a challenge because individuals often see cybersecurity as a constraint or an inconvenience. MFA takes time. Everything that I need to do to remain secure is kind of a, it's kind of like tying my shoelaces together. It feels that way often. So do you have any advice again to the business leaders that are in attendance that uh, on how they can encourage a culture that values cybersecurity? I think that um, the technique we found to be the most useful, both in the security area and in the business continuity area, was to, <clears throat> wherever we could make a parallel uh, recommendation between home and work, we did that. Um, so a company, you know, I would urge a company, a smaller, medium-sized business that you should have designated areas where your people, when they exit the building, because there's a problem, they go to and they stay there until they can be head counted and we mm -hmm. can make sure we've got everyone, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or you should, uh, establish a phone tree with people outside your physical area. So you can let someone know outside a disaster area that you're okay. We found that uh, taking the time to help employees make their own family plans that paralleled what the company was doing was really effective in making them understand both the risk and want to manage that and seeing the bigger picture at the co corporate level as well. Because it makes them the risk manager of individuals of that they love and they, and they that's carry what, very that's much what my, That's what my book is. That's what that book you had in your hand. It Indeed, says, I can attest to manage, that. <laughs> how do you manage your own personal risk? And it starts at home and then it talks about at school, at work, online, and then while traveling. Those in all those ways, how can you manage your own risk? And and situational awareness is at the heart of every one of those recommendations. Indeed. You know, one thing in our prior talk, this reminds me, and I'm just going to put a plug because this is one of my favorite series of books, but oh. um, the Gavin De Becker books, yeah, which are, oh, did you? Uh, they're fascinating books. He wrote, wrote a couple of books. He's probably written several since then, but his first was The Gift of Fear, which is exactly about situational awareness that when people that have had horrible things, that have been physically attacked, oftentimes have that little voice in their head before that said, you know, I shouldn't go down that dark alleyway. And his point is you should learn to listen to that voice and pay attention to it and act on it because it's there to protect you. But now I'm gonna I'm gonna make throw a big curveball at you though because <laughs> I'm gonna draw on something else that was really influential. A year ago, we had Dr. Eric Huffman present to our audience, and he presented on the psychology of cybersecurity. And one of the things that he said that stuck with me more than anything, and it's available, it's at EXP Academy and, and on YouTube. You can review it. But he said, I want to read it, so I'm sure I'm getting it right. But he said. We're living in a world that we're not built for. And what he means is that we have 6 million years of evolution that teaches us to jump back when we see a snake. We have 100 years of experience that tells us that a plane is safe. We have a few decades that tell us how to engage in online and with a computer. 
and weeks, months, not even a year in how to interact with artificial intelligence. So can you speak to that about how perception confuses us or may lead us down the wrong path or or maybe how, how we can navigate this new and unfamiliar world that we're all living in now? Well, the most, uh, the biggest challenge I had after 911 is sort of related to that. Um, so when you're training employees um, on business continuity, there are a range of situations in which the professional advice for years has been to shelter in place. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get people to do that after 911. Uh -huh. They simply, in an undisciplined kind of way to begin with, ran out of the building out into the middle of the street, mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, I would say, much more uh, uh, a response uh, to an earthquake in South America or something like that right. um, uh -huh. th than it is otherwise. Um, and that was, and it's, and I think it's still the case to a certain extent. I still talk to emergency managers who, work off that so the the perception is you got to get out you got to get out uh, because those people in those buildings on 911 they didn't get out some right. of them see what they don't understand is most of them got out there were something like 20 some thousand people in there mm -hmm. 3,000 people died which is not insignificant that's not what i'm saying but and many of them had been well-trained by emergency managers on how to move down, say, from the 42nd story to the street, which is what they had to do. Some had to come down for the, couldn't come down, actually mm -hmm. couldn't come down. Um, I'm sure there are other examples of that as well. I think part of it with uh, cybersecurity and ICT in general is that uh, we just, it just seems like it's a device that we're dealing with. And all of the processes that we see in operating a computer every day um, seem well thought out. And we've been in fact trained on how to use programs depending on how custom they are, you know, depends on the business you're in, I'm sure. Um, but we don't tend to see technology as a source of threat to us. It's, we t tend to think of the threats as external, I mean, really external. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how else to answer you. Uh, there's, a, there, there's a gap between perception and reality. There's a gap between how significant a risk is and what we think it's worth on the risk scale. Often mm -hmm. we've overestimated the amount of risk. The common examples are a doctor telling you it's no more likely that you would die from taking this medicine than that you would be hit on I-5 at 1 p.m. on a Thursday afternoon by another car, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. <laughs> you know, um, that implied authority or the familiarity of the trust that we place in software, yeah. it, it, it used to be that people believed what they read in print. <laughs> and more and more recently, and I don't want to get too far into media, but more and more recently, people are, have become more skeptical, but people have a high level of trust with software. And one thing, I'm going to bring this around to something that's really relevant this week. We've um, noticed a really uh, a, a significant increase in the frequency of phishing attacks that include a QR code. And this is something that was just brought huh. to my attention this week. And it, it's effective because people have that bias. They see a QR code. And it, it must be pretty, legitimate. Yeah, it looks pretty sophisticated, but anyone can generate a QR code that leads anywhere. And so you need to be, people know to be suspicious of links, but they might be more trusting of a QR code, pull up their phone, they go to it, they 
believe they're resetting multi-factor authentication. Really, somebody's harvesting all their password information, uh, gaining control, their business emails compromised, and all the resulting consequences from that. So uh, that kind of ties to what you're saying um, in that there's some level of trust of this tool and we give it some level of authority because we've been interacting with it and trusting it in some ways for a long time. And we have very high expectations that it won't fail us. Yes. Which explains why people get just so upset when their hard drive fails. For <laughs> Well, so let's jump into that. So the solution for a lot of problems with technology is backup and disaster recovery. And when we talk about backup and disaster recovery with business leaders, we talk about how long are you going to be down and how far back in time do you have to go? What they call the, the recovery time objective and the recovery point objective. Yep. And th those are easy problems for tech people to talk about. What is difficult is first of all when when folks realize that the closer you get to zero seconds the more expensive it gets well that's right and then what happens then is where a lot of us myself included are at a loss is now we need to quantify that risk we need to calculate what really is the cost of downtime what's the likelihood of this event happening so can you speak to that again from like a drawing from your background at the enterprise level, but aimed at like the small and medium-sized business computing level. Do you have any things to offer on that? You know, I had it easy at WAMU because uh, if, uh, uh, the, the, if a senior vice president who owned a business platform or piece of software um, wanted to say, you know, on one hand to them, it was the most important thing in the world. The response time had to be less than eight hours. Wow. Um, that uh, Then they find out how much that would cost and they go, well, maybe it's not so important after all. And then we had to figure out how to, how to back up and said, if that's what you're going to say, we're going to send you into the chief risk officer to sign off on a document that says right. you're accepting the risk of not of of 72 hours or whatever they 48 hours, whatever they choose, even though in the estimation of our office, we consider your application or platform to be high risk and high value to the company. Right. People are I don't know that, you, that I don't know okay. how often you can do that um, at a at a lower level, but um, it, and it kind of since you're a sales guy, I'll say this. You know, I mean, sometimes the sales guys from outside talk a owner of a business process into a piece of software, which, you know they're describing how immediate the recovery will be and how, but what they failed to do is line that out as a cash item in the sale. Um, so we're left picking up the pieces after the fact saying, well, you have to pay for recovery. Oh, right. Right. Oh yeah. You see. Meaning like the uploading data, there's costs associated with that. They're, they're, the yeah. recovery itself has a cost associated yeah. with it. When I when I went to the bank, I, things were pretty uh, uneven. Um, you know, the bank had just started to buy some other banks, and it was in the retail banking area. But um, I had to inventory the infrastructure. That's the first job as a technology architect I had to do, and it was all in people's memory. It was not somewhere else. And there was no re no order of recovery established if the mainframe and everything else went down. No order of recovery. Mm -hmm. What comes up first? You know, that's another kind of problem. That's not exactly the same because you're looking at an enterprise level at what do you need first. Uh, and it's not just technical issues. It has to do with where the bank's got its money, where its revenue sources are, and a whole lot of other questions as well. So what I'm hearing from this too, I'm what I'm inferring is for a small business, there also may be tremendous value in tabletop exercises. Absolutely. Oh, where absolutely. all this comes to light. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I 
I think uh, one of the recommend I'm working on a uh, what what will be a talk, but also a white paper uh, on the digital trust landscape. And one of the things I'm going to push hard on is the need for more cooperation between our federal partners like CISA. Um, I mean, we have a Region 10 infrastructure security group that meets maybe once a month. You can get on the call. You can take one of your people. Even if you're a 10-person firm, you can tell one person they need to be on the call. They need to just keep watching bulletins and other documents sent out that may point them to guidance they didn't know about or cooperative training efforts or other things that the federal government is offering. It's so a big thing. Let, let's make a point to follow up with that. I, I want to get links from you that I can share with our audience so that, because these are things that I'm not as aware of. I am aware at a large level that at a higher level that we, we are seeing a lot more cooperation between the public and private sector from uh, re recent release from the Department of Defense, and it mentions CMMC and other regulation that has sort of a public and private cooperation. The White House, too, has in their right. strategy statement that came out in March referred to that as well as a greater partnership between uh, the public and private sector. So it sounds like you see that as an encouraging trend. And oh, well, absolutely. No, I, absolutely. Uh, and that would include, you know, before something happens, it would really be nice to have met, even if only on a call, your local FEMA private sector representative, right? So you had that contact information handy if you ever needed it. Indeed. Um, but there's there's actual work groups that people can belong to. And I think that's that's really uh, important, that that whole piece. And what goes along with that is scenario testing, whether it's just mm -hmm. a test of a wildfire taking down your remote location or a cluster bomb hitting, or you know, uh, how are you going to exit your people out of a downtown core mm -hmm. um, during an earthquake? You know, there are lots of scenarios. Um, and you can include just your own people but you know what would be important to do would be, and Kelly, I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but you should inv include your vendor as well. Oh, and yeah, especially yes. if your vendor is responsible for bringing you back up, um, you need to include your vendor. And then, depending, uh, you look at what else you're uh, dependent on that belongs, say, to the city or to the state. Um, and try to get representatives in. So if we were doing um, a dirty bomb downtown, we would have the fire department in there, we'd mm -hmm. have the police department in there, we would have the state emergency management people along with Seattle, uh, Seattle's great emergency management office. Mm -hmm. that, it's, it's, it's something it I need like to- It like that takes a lot of time we did it once a month. You don't have to do it. You could do it quarterly. You could do a quarterly test and engage your public partners at the same time in the test and mm -hmm. have a lot of uh, built-in uh, knowledgeability in case something does happen. You, you know, and I, I will plug one other test that's very small scale and highly informative. Um, there are folks on this call that are not clients of EXP Technical, and especially for those folks, um, a test restore from your backups, just retrieving oh, yeah. a random file. It's it's one of the most valuable and informative checks you can do on your backup and disaster recovery and humbling, mechanism. And humbling. Yes. <laughs> Eye-opening. That's right. <laughs> because you're monitoring this process. It indicates that it completed successfully. You have all this faith in it, but then you go to retrieve data and you find out, oh, all those files are corrupt. We can't, it's all gibberish. That's right. That comes out when you try to retrieve a random email message and a random file and do that on at least a monthly basis. The plug EXP technical can do that for you. Um, but regardless, you know, even if you have internal IT resources, it should be a KPI in your meetings too. How was it? How did we perform on our last test restore? And it's a, a quick test. 
And it's a really informative spot check. So I want to shift gears again a little bit, but this kind of, uh, uh, there was something that you said in your book that caught my attention and it kind of ties to what we're saying, because you're talking a little bit about community I and am. the emergency response and emergency preparedness community. And in your book, the sentence that caught my, I might not be reading it right, but you said that your mother was part of a community club where she they was. discussed disaster preparedness and books and emergency supplies. Can you I can you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. That's a small town of eleven hundred people at the time when I was growing up. Uh-huh. And I think that you know my memories of it may be faulty in some ways, but I think they met maybe once a month. And that sometimes they had speakers and then sometimes they were working on things. Um we have in the neighborhood I live in now, uh, 300 house uh, disaster preparedness uh, area. We're mm -hmm. organized on a, a blog, but we've also broken the neighborhood up into zones. And there are, we know who all the doctors or nurses or emergency management EMTs who might live in the area. We have a good idea of what Homes might have supplies like chainsaws if we need the, them mm -hmm. um, and other things. We have uh, daycare and senior care centers, which are houses within the area. There are five zones. And so we've done that and we've pre-purchased through donations a range of supplies, emergency supplies as well. It, it's fascinating for me and for us at EXP Technical because community is one of our highest values at EXP. And one of the things, I'm tipping my cards a little bit, but this event is a little bit more interactive than some of the events that we've had in the past. And we we have ideas of establishing that sort of community, maybe not for emergency preparedness, but more of a tech club or <laughs> where, yeah. where we can talk about how to recover the technology yeah. or what are you doing to enhance operational efficiency in your organization? So again, for folks listening, the future events may be a little bit more interactive and a little bit less of the one-to-many broadcast and more of many-to-many -many conversations. Because I believe, and it sounds like you've experienced this or your family has, there's some power we can learn a lot from each other when we share knowledge, you know, share success. Um, there, there's a lot that can be gained that we might not be able to discover on our own. Do you think we should open it up for questions? I think we should. Um, I haven't seen any come in on the chat, but I'm, I wonder if maybe I'm not. I do see that there is a large group in attendance and they've stuck with us the whole way through. So this is your chance. We're, we're com coming a little bit short on time. So if you have a question, feel free to chime in in the chat session or the Q&A. And otherwise, while we're waiting for that, I have a... I can jump into a few others as well. And this is yeah, one that you can. Oh my goodness. I see your three by five cards. I know. I, I, Here they are. I, I'm all prepped for you. Here they are. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, if, forgive me if this is too personal, but you came to teaching later in life. Late. Yes. Were you always a teacher? No. Oh, yes, I was. Right. Anyone who's known me for a long time said you were always teaching. So. When I was at the, um, this is this precedes anything you said about me, but I was at the Seattle Art Museum, ran the Office of Public Affairs for seven years before Delphi, my computer company. I, I took interns from four different universities in the Office of Public Affairs. I, at Delphi, I set up relationships with North Seattle Community College because of their tech program and a couple of other places as well, Lake Washington, Vogue Tech, um, and had interns from both of the, from those places as well. So my husband is a professor, my son is a professor. Um, I never thought I would teach. Uh, and yet when I finished uh, at WAMU and I was setting up my company, two people from the faculty at the iSchool met with me and said, you should teach because you have all this experience. And they knew me from a relationship I had with the iSchool as part of being part of corporate sponsor for some of its programs. Mm -hmm. um, and nothing 
ever that I did in my career has been as rewarding as teaching. I love working with people. I love being a perpetual student myself so that there's something always not in my comfort zone that I'm going to try to learn. Uh, and I'm not backing away from that, even in retirement from teaching now. Um, I say that you always get back more than you give when you teach. And that's mm -hmm. really true. And I, I like to think of myself as having all those years been training the next generation of risk managers. And I can hear the passion in your voice. Oh, good. When, when we get on that it's topic. So, so Several of my students, I, my former students who are quite corporate employees now um, are on this call, I believe. Oh, well, shout out to those folks. I did see there were a few names that I didn't recognize. So I'm assuming those are some of the folks. Um, and uh, so what have you learned from your students? Was there, is there a give, uh, you know, did they give back to you in that sense and that they challenge you or push oh, yes. you into I, new areas? Um, I, I can almost hear them laughing. There's, there's something in the chat now. Um, I almost insist upon it being challenged in class. I expect to have people poke at me and say, why do you say that? Or I don't agree. And I encourage disagreement. I encourage people to take a perspective that it, they're not comfortable with. It's not their natural perspective and try to look at the problem from someone else's point of view. Um, there are lots of exercises like that. But and mostly what I learn from them is about their situations. And um, I'm able to help some of them as well. And uh, I'm terribly proud of the work because I have published student papers that are outstanding or excellent as research notes through ASA. Um, their work, they have publishable material, published material that's on their uh, resume that often helps them get a job as well. Mm -hmm. I and think. We're okay. in our final minutes here. We did have a question come in through the Q&A, and I think we hit on this a little bit, but you might want to elaborate, which is, how do you see AI being used against small business in cyber attacks? You had mentioned the um, th that it can be- I think that it just will keep learning from the, the way they, uh, the designers of that software are working. They'll just get smarter about how to approach you the next time. Right. Um, Again, the Jurassic Park, and it's like the raptors in Jurassic Park. They keep right. testing the fence. <laughs> they keep learning. Exactly, that's exactly right. Um, I think I have time. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go I was going to say I have time for one more question. And we do have one from the chat from the Q&A, which is um, what role should larger companies play in supporting or requiring smaller suppliers, third parties, to comply with security controls? Oh, um, I'm not familiar with the situation in which that's not the case. One of the things I managed was vendor security for Washington Mutual. Mm -hmm. So we had a whole attestation form separate from the contract and things written into the contract as well on business continuity, confidentiality, uh, data usage, all of those kinds of things that you might expect when you're in a third party relationship. Right. Um, I think uh, you should be prepared if you want to grow your business to make sure you're within established frameworks or standards um, and that you meet those standards um, so that you can actually be hired by a larger company. Right. And we see that, you know, I, I will just add, we see that from several perspectives. Like you're saying, there are organizations like Microsoft that have those requirements Con of their vendors. There are also, there's a, a, a support through the government with programs like CMMC that uh, encourage that to pass down to That's right. all the suppliers in the defense industrial base. And one thing that we didn't mention, but is a topic for an upcoming event like this, uh, cyber insurance has that same level of there's an attestation or a, a you know validation that you have certain controls in place, and that may be a topic for another time. I you know I still have a big stack of questions now, for you, you Annie. Have three, three more in the <laughs> but, Q and A. Yeah. Well, oh, I think we've got those. And oh, good. 
we are butting up against our time limit. And thank so, you, Kelly. Well, I wanted to thank you. You made this really fun and it, it's really informative. I learned a lot. I hope the folks in attendance learned as well. Are there any final comments that you have to share with our group before we wrap up here? No, just that I think that small businesses are the backbone of this country. And I think that one of the most exciting things you can do is found a company and grow it. I took a lot of pleasure and delight in doing that. And I was rewarded for that by, with really great customers. And okay. our focus was like, I'm sure a lot of you um, was in solving problems for your customers. That's, that's what you're there to do. Um, and that can lead to progressively larger contracts. Yeah, I think you have to decide how large you want to grow and what you need to get to that point. Um, and I thank you for giving me the chance to sort of come back and talk about small and medium-sized businesses rather than <laughs> big corporations. <for> right. <laughs> <laughs> where can people find you if they want to, is there a blog, a LinkedIn page? Where, where are you There's available? A, I have a website called AnnieSearle.com. So it's all one word, A-N-N-I-E-S-E-A-R-L-E. Dot com. It has a blog on it. It also has, I'm sure in a couple of places, my email address, which is Annie at AnnieSearle.com. And you're welcome to contact me. If you're interested in any of the links I was talking about, I'm going to try to put one document together for Kelly and send it to him. And you can check in with Kelly to get it, or you can contact me directly. But sure. if you're a client of his, I'm sure he's happy to do the heavy lifting on this. Sure. I will follow up with that. We have also recorded this event. We'll make that available and I'll follow up with an email to the audience so that you know, so that you have access if you want to go back and replay this. And with that, thank you so much, Annie. I think that does it for time. I really appreciate that you took the time to meet with us today and I learned a lot. Thank you again. Thank you.